Hello everyone, I hope everyone is truly doing well, everyone is safe and healthy of course. This is a very different video and it has nothing to do with potential asteroid impact or the magnetic reversal or volcanic activity or earthquakes, none of that. This video will be looking at the Northern American Native Americans. There's a lot of problems going on that people are not aware of throughout the reservations here in North America, including Canada. You see, the reservations, they have their own government. They do not have to report those who are sick and those who have died to the state. If that information was released, you will see a 10% increase in the numbers. Thousands are dying in North America with this virus and thousands have died before the virus came here. Thousands from poverty, sickness, disease, suicide, alcohol, and drugs. You see the Native Americans, they have been beaten down so far. They may not get back up this time, but I believe they will. I believe they will. And this video goes out to all of the Native Americans, brothers and sisters, as well as those that are in Canada. Here on the sanctuary, I have Native American ruins that go back 2,500 years related to the Anastasi. And we have a dear sister, I'm not going to mention her name, who is going through extremely difficult times. And sister, this is for you, your family, all of our brothers and sisters. And it was a subscriber, Sam. A wonderful subscriber sent me a link. And I said, I'm going to do this. I have to do this. My grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee. And her parents and grandparents 
Walk the Trails of Tears from Mississippi where the government gathered up the Cherokee people, the Choctaw from Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, Louisiana, and Arkansas and made them march in the dead of winter to Oklahoma. It is called the Trails of Tears. Approximately 25 to 30 percent of them died along the way and the government knew they would. From flu, pneumonia, and other diseases. So this is for you sister, your family, my ancestors, Governments do not listen to our brothers and sisters, and they have the truth. We have to live spiritually with Mother Earth and Father Sky. If we do not, Mother Earth will make the adjustment, and it's called the Great Purification. Time evolves and comes to a place where it renews again. There is first a purification time, then there is renewal time. We are getting very close to this time now. We were told that we would see America come and go. And in a sense, America is dying from within because 
They forgot the instructions on how to live on Earth. Everything is coming to a time where prophecy and man's inability to live on Earth in a spiritual way will come to a crossroad of great problems. It's the Hopi belief, it's our belief that if you're not spiritually connected to the Earth and understand the spiritual reality of how to live on Earth, likely you will not make it. When Columbus came, that began what we term as the First World War. That was the true First World War when Columbus arrived. Because along with him came everybody from Europe. By the end of the Second World War, we were, in America, we were only 800,000 from 60 million to 800,000. So we were almost exterminated here in America. Everything is spiritual. Everything has a spirit. Everything... Everything was brought to you by the Creator, the one Creator. Some people call him God, some people call him Buddha, some people call him Allah, some people call him other names. We call him Tonkashila, Grandfather. We're here on Earth only a few winters. Then we go to the spirit world. The spirit world is, is more real than most of us believe. The spirit world is, is everything. Over 95% of our body is water. And in order to stay healthy, you've got to drink good water. When the European first came here, Columbus, we could drink out of any river. If the Europeans had lived the Indian way when they came, we'd still be drinking out of water because the water is sacred. The air is sacred. Our DNA is made of the same DNA as the tree. The tree breathes what we exhale. When the tree exhales, we need what the tree exhales. So we have a common destiny with the tree. We are all from the earth. And when the earth, the water, the atmosphere is corrupted, then it will create its own reaction. Mother is reacting. In the Hopi prophecy, they say the storms and floods will become greater. To me, it's not a negative thing to know that there will be great changes. It's not negative. It's evolution. When you look at it as evolution, it's time. Nothing stays the same. We always say 
that might be your ancestor, but it's not our ancestor. He is a relative, but not our ancestor. You should learn how to plant something. That's the first connection. You should treat all things as spirit. Realize that we are one family. It's never something like the end. Just like life, there is no end to life. So something strange has come over this country, which is the fulfillment of our prophecies that that mighty wind has come. In wind, you do not see it, you only feel it. So there's a feeling that has come over people. And when we talk about the Indian way of life, perhaps it is an error to say Indian way of life. It is only a human being way of life. But it so happens that the native people have preserved that way of life. Every creation still follows the original instructions of life. The fruits, they come in a circle farm. Many of our vegetables are round. All natural things follow that circle. I've been to Switzerland, Germany, Belgium, all over. In Switzerland, they have preserved their castle. Right next door is the torture chambers in which they tortured their people. Then tell me who the savage is. We had no jailhouses. Does it mean that we had no laws? Or does it mean that we had no criminals? We know. We understand. Um, Chief Arvo Looking Horse from Lakota Sioux Nation. We're here on my reservation, the Cheyenne River Reservation. A great teaching has come among, among the people. When they disrespect the way of life. And the Creator told the people, you got to live a way of life. But because that uh, we're human beings, that, uh, the people, they abuse that life, a way of life, and that's when all the animals and the buffalo disappeared. But it's going to take uh, all people to uh, really uh, uh, come together, you know, with good heart and good mind. My name is Dave Swallow Jr. You know. I'm talking here on the Black Hills. My grandfather said this is a sacred place, a holy place, the heart of Mother Earth. And uh, today when I come through here, all the buffaloes were gone. I seen posted of no trespassing. And it hurts my heart to see it says this land is for sale. Then I seen them cutting trees for nothing because they're going to build a road here in the Black Hills again. My great-great ancestors, my grandfathers and their grandfathers, crazy horse, they wanted to preserve this land for their grandchildren, which it is us. On the first time Columbus came, this was a land of free. There was no tax. There was no ordinances, only the laws of the Creator. See. <laughs> Imagine how a king is it your spy, Kile Hesapa King, Lilo Wakan. Mitaki ate Tashunka with go to your spy. Mitaki ye ina Wambli Zuya to your spy. This is a traditional greeting of my people that I am bound to give, albeit it's a short version. What I said in my own language, translated into English thusly. Hello, my relatives. I am an Oglala Lakota, and I come from our very sacred holy land, the Black Hills, where Yellow Thunder Village is. My mother is from the War Eagle clan, and my father's family is from the Crazy Horse Clan. This greeting is to this day the way all Indians throughout the nation still greet one another, those that still know their culture. This is the only way we present ourselves to one another that is acceptable. We tell you who we are 
where we are from, who we are from, our clans, and we do this without ever saying our name. Anything less would be an insult to you and to my people. Senators, my morning prayers to the great mystery always include you and your colleagues in Congress, as well as leaders in all governments. It is an honor to come before you as a spokesman for my people, the American Indians of the United States of America. In these United States of America, this great country of ours, we American Indians, we can be anything we want to be except American Indians. And that is created by the laws of this nation and condoned by its subsidiaries, the so-called tribal government, and designed for the Indian to fail, to be expendable, to be eliminated. I take you back in your history. After the American Indian hostiles had been subdued and forcibly confined to Indian reservations, it took approximately 30 years, one generation, for us to adjust and become economically viable. Contrary to what the anthropologists say and what we even ourselves are taught as Indian people. However, allotments were made smaller, our remaining lands were open to homesteading, and we were forced into reducing our livestock. Nevertheless, we made the adjustment again in less than half the aforementioned time, 15 years, and become economically self-sufficient again. But once again, the American Indian was forced into reducing our livestock. The boss farmer concept was instituted. We were told what, when, where, how much, and how little we could grow. This applied to agriculture and our livestock. Again, we recovered in a time span of approximately 15 years. We were so successful in our third recovery that the American Indians enjoyed the finest of economic times, while the rest of the industrialized world was wallowing in the Great Depression. It was then that President Roosevelt introduced the Howard Wheeler Act, better known as the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA which institutionalized the so-called tribal governments, which are not one of our institutions, and it is still foreign to us this very day. We have yet to recover. I believe Russell summed it up. Very respectable manner. You know, the great elders are so wise and full of knowledge that is very simple it's not complex it is to live with harmony peace and understanding and transformation with the earth the water and father sky the great spirit the next part of this video I wanted to be somewhat conservative. I didn't want to shock people of what is taking place. I'm sick of it. I'm so disappointed in the United States federal government. They have done nothing for the people of this land nothing I remember in Arizona they put them on a new type of reservation and down the stream they wasn't able to grow food because the water was contaminated up the stream they built plants and they dumped all of their waste into the water. And senators got kickbacks from the state of Arizona. You see, it's all about greed and corruption. It's not about unconditional love. 
It's not about helping your brothers and sisters. It's none of that. This is happening throughout North America and Canada with the reservations. And no one is saying anything about it. Simply sweep it under the rug. It's truly sad. I'd like to finish this video. This is Shiprock Peak, the sacred heart of Navajo Nation, 27,000 square miles, a sight so beautiful it takes your breath away. But this morning we want you to meet the real heart of Navajo Nation, not the postcard, the people. Almost 200,000 of America's first citizens live here, and their hearts are filled with fear. I kind of um, get worried, but I just leave it at that. Lucinda Thomas is 71. She lives with her husband and grandkids, and like about 30% of the people here, they have no running water. The nearest pump, miles and miles away. Eugene So is a tribal council representative. His home doesn't have running water either. He says his community is becoming increasingly desperate the casinos and coal mine now closed. Mostly we don't have no money since this started. How worried is he? <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> well, if there's any words I can say to how much I am worried about the people of the reservation and my community. nothing coming in. So I am worried about Can't sleep. Can't think right. In this vast space, almost 40% of the homes have no electricity either. They are used to making do, and that's lucky, because promised federal aid has only just begun to trickle in after five weeks of pleading for help. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez. Sometimes uh, we, we feel that we tribal uh, people, tribal nations, are at the bottom of the list when it comes to limited resources. Just a few days ago you told us you hadn't received a penny. Well, we're hopeful uh, that uh, this week will be a better week for us. We're not going to roll over or we're not going to feel sorry for ourselves. You know, it just seems uh, alarming that the first citizens of this country are kind of pushed to the back burner. There are people helping. The Arizona National Guard flew in supplies. A team from Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health has been on the ground for more than 30 years. Hopkins staff are now building hand washing stations. Those hand washing stations are costing us about $30 a piece to construct. They could be life saving in these settings at this time. Hopkins is also delivering aid. Jamie Begay distributing supplies. This box to Helen George, a traditional weaver who is diabetic and lives alone 20 miles out of town. I wash my hands every every hour, it seems like. You know, she told us that she didn't have a vehicle. Had we not gone out there, you know, when would have been the next time that she would be able to get the kind of supplies that we were able to provide? As for the local hospitals, there is a desperate need for staff, says Dr. Diana Hu. She's worked here for 35 years. The biggest part of our team that's a problem is that we have a 30% vacancy rate for our nursing staff. And that was before the virus. We got the first wave of patients, so we kind of got the first tsunami, which overwhelmed a lot of our capability. The message from all those we spoke to, help is needed and fast. Our federal government has broken promise after promise after promise. And what we're seeing today is the accumulation of those broken promises and where it has left people. It has happened so many times where Indians were wiped out by disease. We don't want to go that route. So I want them to help us like right now and yesterday. America's biggest cities have seen large numbers of people being infected by this pernicious virus. One of the hardest hit populations is the Navajo Nation. They span across three states and have more than 3,100 cases, the highest per capita rate of coronavirus infection anywhere in the U.S. Reggie Cicchini reports. Lost in the spotlight of the seemingly endless outbreaks in urban areas, 
A deadly battle is underway deep in the desert. We gotta stay vigilant. America's Navajo Nation, one of the oldest indigenous reservations in the country, is sinking under the weight of the virus. Tribal nations, the first citizens, are put on the bottom of the list, it seems to us. We spoke to the nation's president, Jonathan Nez, in April, when there were 698 positive cases. Today, the infection rate per capita is now the highest in America. Covering just over 77,000 square kilometers, over three states, Navajo Nation has a population of 175,000 and is roughly the size of New Brunswick. We just want everybody to recognize that tribal communities are in need of assistance as well. Studies have shown people of color are at a heightened risk of contracting this virus. Navajo residents suffer from high rates of diabetes and hypertension, but money and access to care is limited. Federal funding to reservations is often slow to move. Infrastructure is poor. The region is a food desert, meaning residents drive to larger cities, putting themselves at risk. At home, basic mitigation efforts like hand washing are often impossible. 30% of the homes on Navajo Nation don't have running water. So how are they going to do that? In a rare move, Doctors Without Borders has been dispatched on American soil. Telling Global News in a statement, their team is providing training on infection prevention and control, adding they will help expand contact tracing. Their presence in the U.S. is a first. The organization typically assists in war-ravaged and low-income nations. A $2 trillion stimulus package approved in March will provide more than half a billion dollars in aid to the Navajo. But local leaders say it's too little and far too late. Tribal nations have contributed a lot to this country. And we're just saying that we want our share of resources. COVID-19 adding yet another challenge in the ongoing struggle to maintain independence and equality across American reservations. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. You see... The people of the earth has lost their way. They have lost their ways. You see, when the people do not have a definition of themselves, and the people do not have a direction, they are spiritually lost and a false illusion of hope that they print out of thin air. We have lost the connection with Mother Earth, Father Sky, and the Great Spirit. According to the Hopi, we are living in the fourth world. That means Civilization dealing with humans almost perished four times. And it is stated, when the human civilization is taking more than the earth can provide and destroying the earth willfully, it will be the time of the great purification because the humans have separated themselves from Mother Earth, Father Sky, and the Great Spirit, and is no longer living in harmony with the understanding of certain principles and ethics that is becoming lost. Now we are going to listen one of the last interviews of one of the greatest elders in modern time history. Oren Lyons, that's my English name. Joat Grisho is my clan name. Uh, the Wolf is my, my clan. Anadog is my nation. The Haudenosaunee is the Confederacy. And the Confederacy is better known as the Iroquois. We're old people. Been here a long time. 
So the first question, from your vantage point and from your people's vantage point, what is creation? Well, that's huge. It's huge like creation. Creation is the universe. Creation is everything that we can see and probably a whole lot that we can't, probably more that we can't see. But it's what's about us and it's the relationship, this amazing uh, web of life that we have here. And, and nature, which is part of creation, is more like the earth itself in its part, in its position, in this whole web of life in the creation. We have relationships with uh, all the elements and forces of life, including the sun, we call our elder brother, the moon, we call our grandmother, the uh, winds, we call our grandfathers, the four directions, our grandfathers, and then all of the elements of life itself. So, in this idea of creation, nature is the earth itself, and we call the earth mother, Itinoha, our mother, as we call all women Itinoha, mothers. And from mothers spring life, and we understand that. And we know that life springs from the earth, that generations that are looking up layer upon layer, waiting their time to come up and, and serve and be, is our responsibility. So the earth is, is female. How are, the earth is, a fe is the mother, and so how are humans described? What kind of what kind of agents are and then if, if if you have um, if you have a mother then you have children so we're children we're children of the earth and uh, we're tied to the earth we come from the earth and we go back to the earth and and the earth has a great systems of uh, regeneration great cycles of regenerative life and it's these cycles that we're all part of, just as the earth has seasons of life, all animals and all things that grow and fly, and, and including humans, have seasons of life as well. And so we, we grow in the same style. What's different about all of that is the time, the time that's allocated to the varieties of life that are on the earth. And we have a fairly long system of life, but not the longest. Turtles live beyond, beyond us. Parrots live beyond us. Um, there are certain mammals that, that are, have an older uh, life cycle than we do, but we have a long life cycle as it is on Earth. And then also, when you move down to the fine insects, then their life cycle is counted in days. So what you have is this variety and complexity of life and, and the times that are allocated and what happens during those times for each of these elements. That's what's important to understand. In the understanding of the earth, how does, what does, what are your recommendations for how we should treat the, how humans treat the world and the planet and our resources? What is the disposition that we need to take, humans, toward the gifts that the planet provides us? Well, well what I've noticed and know about indigenous people around the earth is that many, many indigenous nations have have been able to uh, to hang on to the knowledge that they have, the traditional knowledge, fortunately, I think, for everybody. And, uh, 
And in this traditional knowledge is the um, directions uh, or the instructions for a good life. So we have instructions about uh, how do we conduct ourselves on this earth. And probably the first one is uh, respect. And I think if there was a law, a common law around the world, uh, indigenous peoples, and I think everybody, respect is a law. And, and if people followed this law, simple law of respect, you'd have a lot more peace and you'd have a lot more uh, quiet and, and, and a better life. So I'd say respect, uh, conduct yourself accordingly and, and recognize what your obligations are and what your duties are. And the duties are to protect these life forms when the peacemaker came to our territory about a thousand years ago and brought this whole concept of peace as the original five nations, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, Senecas, uh, we're in a constant warfare. And we had really forgotten our instructions that we had prior to that and we're not living by them. And the peacemaker came among us and, and brought this whole idea, concept of peace and democracy. And he gave it to us whole. And it took him a long time to do that. There's a whole story about how he came and how we worked with Hayan Wenta, whom you call Hiawatha, and how they worked and brought together this great confederacy called the Haudenosaunee based on peace based on equity and justice for people and based on the power of the good minds, the power of unity, the issues of health, all given to us a thousand years ago. And, and he laid out the process by which we, we do this. And, and one of the first things he said was he was going to give great responsibility to the women since the earth is female, then the women should be working with the earth. Men would be in charge of fire. Women would be in charge of water. And so we're, we're the, the men, our, our work to see to the welfare. We do counseling. We do meetings. We do all of that. And if needs be, we fight. Uh, but basically we're, we're dedicated to peace. And that was what's, what's so important about that time a thousand years ago. When if you looked in, in Europe at that time, as great wars were going on, and the whole history of Europe, as I saw it, is one war after the other, century after century, how people lived in constant, constant fear, and thousands of thousands of people died. Well. In this part of the, the universe, which was kind of just uh, isolated, Western Hemisphere wasn't even known about, we were, we were operating under a different system. And it was basically one of respect and councils of, of leaders to try to keep the peace, because human nature is human nature. And you have to have a process by which to meet problems. And you have to have uh, rules and so forth. So the rules was always based around respect. And fundamental to all of that was, was the understanding of how the earth itself uh, was paramount to all of our life. And so in this uh, idea of respect was also the understanding of what we should do and how we should conduct ourselves according to the elements of the earth and all of the natural worlds. So we always said that we were, we have been told and understand that we're relatives. And where our white brother will talk about water and talk trees and animals and fish as resources, we talk about them as relatives. And that's a whole different perspective. If you think that they're relatives and you understand it and, and you understand that, then you're going to treat them differently. 
and the responsibility the peacemaker sent to us were very clear. He planted a great tree of peace, a great white pine, a great symbol to our nations. He said, this is the great tree of peace. He said, its roots will be four white roots of truth that reach in the four directions of the earth. And those that have no, nowhere to go can follow the root back to its source and come under the protection of the great tree. And he says, on top of this tree, I place the eagle and the eagle who will watch everything and watch and guard the security of this tree and will let us know when problems are coming. And he said that this tree of peace is a spiritual law. It represents a spiritual law. And the spiritual law is the law of nature. And he told us explicitly, never challenge this law because you cannot prevail. You will not prevail. Wrap your laws, your rules, and your conduct. He said, you, the leaders, when you're, when you're weak as a human being, he said, this tree will give you your spine strength. Wrap yourself around this tree because it's powerful. Do not challenge the laws of nature because you cannot, you will not prevail. Now that's great wisdom. That's a thousand years ago. And it reminded us uh, of, of our obligations. And so Indian nations in North America, South America, Central America, as far as I know, indigenous people around the world all have ceremonies. And these ceremonies are thanksgivings for what we have. Uh, we have just now initiated uh, a great ceremony for the trees at Onondaga and the longhouses of the Six Nations still operational and we hold these ceremonies for the leader of the trees which is the maple. The maple is the leader and so we have a ceremony of thanksgiving as soon as the sap starts running and then when the sap stops then we'll have a closure ceremony but in between we're thankful for all trees of this earth wherever they are, whatever their names are, those that we know and those that we don't, we give thanks. And so if this kind of instruction were given and understood by other people, and you wouldn't be cutting trees all over the world and destroying the infrastructure of life and everything that's in the woods. We had a, a, a profound agreement when we first initiated the five nations, later become the six nations with the uh, Tuscarora nation, came in 1713, 1722, became the six nation. But we all agreed. We all agreed that we would work together and be together. And so we had a treaty amongst ourselves. And it was called simply, One Dish, One Spoon. That's a concept of sharing. And this world has to understand the importance of sharing. The importance of sharing, to share what you have. Conditional people throughout the world, they always work together to gather food, to gather water, and survive. Now, we simply take paper they print out of thin air and go get into a car, fill it with gasoline, and go do our shopping for conveniences. And as a result, this civilization is destroying Mother Earth, Father Sky, and now we are going to go through the great purification. We are about to go into the fourth world, but we will continue. I'd like to thank you all if you made it this far. This far in the video.
one hour long video. I don't think it would have been right to make it 15, 20, or 30 minutes. I hope you all received this message. It's from the elders and it's for the people, all the people throughout the world. If we do not turn this around, it's over. And now the great prophecies are being fulfilled with the Hopi prophecy as well as Bible prophecies, the great purification, seven year tribulations. Now we will witness a different level of the adjustment that the universe Mother Earth is about to make for the purification process. Water is the great purifier and now these rocks are coming. Now we are going to go through purification. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Be safe everyone. Hopefully by Wednesday I will have the next part on safe locations. Get away from the water if you can. You know the Native Americans, you know what they said? It's a good day to die, my son. They was not afraid. They knew, looking into the night sky of the Milky Way galaxy, there's another life waiting for us to cross into. Thank you all. Many blessings of love and understanding. And may God watch over you and your loved ones. He is gone to prepare a praise for us. And he said, do not worry. Let not your heart be troubled. Thank you all. Many blessings.